I don't believe that this is a sentence I've ever uttered to another human being. And I dare say that it's not a sentence perhaps that anyone has ever uttered to someone, which is, not only did I vote for you for the Heisman, I talked my dad into voting for you for the Heisman. So I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time because I thought that team of yours would have done what Cincinnati didn't this year, which is look like a team that could compete with Alabama because you guys beat Auburn, you went undefeated, and you had a bunch of pros on that team. You had a bunch of guys who were very close to being pros, went to tryouts. What was it? Uh, and thank you for making time for us, by the way, because I wanted to talk to you about everything going on in college football. 26 players, 27 players tried out uh, for the pros because you guys, that team looked professional to me, the one that you were quarterbacking. Yeah, you know, we had we had a, a lot of talent, man. Um, you know, I think it speaks to the job George O'Leary did recruiting guys, recruiting NFL caliber guys, and then Coach Frost coming in, changing the culture, and then we just kept that thing rolling. And, um, yeah, we, we had zero holes on those teams in 2017 and 2018, particularly 2017. I feel like um, in the trenches, we really matched up with anybody on both sides of the ball. And, <clears throat> you know, even Coach, Coach Gus Malzahn will tell you, like, we had legit dudes and um, – on both sides of the ball, NFL guys all over, all over the field. And yeah, it was extremely special teams in, in 2017 and 2018. How much, UCF. how much fun were those years for you? How much different did your life become as soon as you're writing something that people couldn't have seen coming? Not that way. Yeah. You know, it was a, it was a special ride and, you know, I feel like we kind of just, uh, really just scratch the surface of what I feel like University of Central Florida is capable of in terms of, you know, college football. Just Orlando is a beautiful city. Uh, UCF is, is the perfect distance from Disney. It's perfect distance from downtown Orlando. It's kind of like its own little area. And it's a beautiful campus. I don't know if you've ever been up here, but what we were able to do just, you know, with myself, Shaquem, just the, the types of personalities we had on that team and, um, Man, it was just a lot of fun with the, with the brotherhood and all that stuff. Like, you know, those are days I always look back and and cherish. And you know, when I when I talk to my guys, we're always reminiscing about the good old days. But but man, it's fun. And and then getting to this kind of chapter of our lives where guys are getting married and stuff like that is pretty cool. No, but take me through it beyond the quarterback speak, though. I want to talk to the guy who was running campus, who was living his dreams, who's. Uh, that's what you wanted when you got into football. I want to be the star guy on campus, and you were. And not only that, but it became a national story. So take me a little deeper through what the fun was. Well, for me, you know, I grew up watching Colt Brennan in Hawaii. So I saw what he was able to do, and, you know, I always kind of envisioned myself doing something like that. And You know, we pretty much did the same thing that he did at Hawaii over here at UCF. Um, but to me, on a larger scale, when in, I think it was 25 straight games, and, um, you know, just the culture that it, that is still here now from, from those times, like it's, there's just a buzz around here waiting to get back to, you know, competing for national championships, conference championships and running the table. And, you know, I feel like we're going to keep doing that. But for me, just living in that moment, um, I was just having fun, man. I wouldn't like, you know, um, I hate to say, I don't hate to say it, but it's kind of what I expected to do, you know, cause I've always felt like I've been a winner. You know, I've, I ran the table in youth football. I ran the table in high school and, you know, I, I came to college, like, you know, I expect to win. I don't go out there hoping to win. And for me, like the expectation is to always win. It doesn't matter who I'm playing. Doesn't matter if we're playing the FCS school or playing Auburn in the Peach Bowl. Like to me, we're suiting up and I expect to win every time I step out there. So your life was like what as you're experiencing it and you become the starting quarterback who's meeting was, his expectations? It was, it was truly a dream come true, but, you know, it was kind of the vision I had for myself. Um, it's better it's better than expected, you know what I mean, when you're living in that moment and you're just enjoying it. But to me, that was always the vision I kind of had. I always envisioned myself playing top-notch Division One football, 
you know, I was kind of under recruited just because, you know, whatever his size doesn't, doesn't really matter. But to me, I fell into a perfect situation at UCF. You know, I just ran with it. You know, I, I knew they weren't too far out of beating Baylor in the Fiesta Bowl. I knew coming to Florida, I'd be surrounded by a lot of talented guys. I didn't know how talented we'd be coming off when I first got there. They lost every game, but I inherited a, an extremely talented football team. And, you know, we had the right guy in Coach Frost to change the culture. And, you know, we just took it and ran with it. So you have a totally unbroken boulevard of green lights where you're just success, 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 success. This is what I expected. I'm, I'm confident. I expect to roll through people and you arrive at your last college game. And what's going to happen now? What are you imagining the future looks like? Well, I wouldn't say everything was all like peaches and roses. You know what I mean? I had to overcome a lot of adversity in terms of like injuries in high school and being under recruited and stuff like that. Like it wasn't always a, a clear path. You know, I had a, I had a grind really to, to get where I wanted to go, but I always knew, um, I felt like I had greatness in me. Uh, it's just the way I was instilled, man. Like my dad was my coach and, you know, he helped bring me up and instilled that winning mentality in me. Um, but for me, you know, going through those growing pains in my freshman year to what we did in 17 and 18. And then this past year was a good learning experience for me, just getting my feet wet back playing again. And, you know, I'm going to finish my career at the Hula Bowl, um, my college career at the Hula Bowl here. And, uh, next Saturday on the 15th, right in the bounce house where it all started. And, you know, it's just fitting for me to play in front of those fans again play in Orlando. It's a special stadium for me. Like I've always played well in there, uh, but yeah, man, I'm, I'm just really excited. And, you know, I'm training for the, the NFL draft and, you know, I'm putting my best foot forward because, you know, I feel like I still got a lot of good ball left in me. You did a good job of promoting the hula bowl. You didn't do a good job of answering my question, which is what you say the last like game. I did. No, what you expected yeah. you've had. Well, what you did was you rebutted my appraisal that you'd always had success by saying, look, bleep off Lebetard. I was an underdog and I had to work for this. That's not what I was saying. I was yeah. just saying, man, this guy did a lot of winning and he expected That's the right. success. He was unsurprised by it. So he gets to campus. He's feeling good about himself. And now he imagines, I would imagine, more success and then a horrific injury. Oh, okay, okay. That that's what you're talking about. Um, yeah, man. That when that happened, you know, you you see stuff like that happen. Um, you know, it's part of the game. You never envision yourself getting carted off the field or anything like that. But, you know, that was that was a tough process to go through. And, you know, but I feel like kind of what I went through earlier in my life having a bad shoulder injury in high school to, you know, having a, a broken foot my freshman year playing through that. Um, I feel like all the lessons I kind of learned growing up helped me set up to overcome something like that. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's not the way I envision my career ending at UCF. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have plans and God has other plans. So that's kind of, that's kind of the way it went for me. And, um, you know, I finished my, my career at a prestigious university in Florida State, and that's a that's a huge honor for me, you know what I mean? Um, to me, getting to play at two great Florida schools where, to me, the South is just different with football, you know what I mean? Like, you see a place like Oregon, it's kind of become a stepping stone job in a way, and when I see stuff like that, I'm like, dang, the football is really rooted here in the South, you know what I'm saying? So getting to play at UCF and then Florida state and just being on both sides of that is it it truly a cool experience. But you know, that, that injury was tough, but to me, it was just lessons learned and, you know, I overcame it and, you know, I feel like those lessons I'll be able to carry with me for as long as I live. Pissed you off that Herb street said that guys should play in the bowl game for us, for the fans, <clears throat> for people other than themselves. Uh, yeah, I mean, I you know, I don't know if he's saying that because of who's paying his bills, you know what I mean? But to me, it's easy to say that when you're getting paid millions of dollars behind a desk, right? A lot of these kids come from nothing. A lot of these kids don't – a lot of these kids' cost of attendance checks are going back home to to their families, you know? Like, 
a scholarship is great. It's an honor, but you, you're working for that scholarship, believe me. And when these kids have a chance to set up their families with generational wealth, I'm not saying money is the, the fixture to everything, but if it can help your family out, if it can help your, your struggling mom and dad and your younger siblings out, like, and you're going to be in a college system where, in all honesty, most college systems, in my opinion, they kind of exhaust the student athletes bodies for four or five years. They drain everything they possibly can out of them to kind of have in like whatever is left, like it's survival mode once you get to the league and trying to stay healthy. I believe the shelf life for average NFL players is two to three years. You get a chance to be a first, second, third round guy and you got to wait another month, two months in that college system where you can be feeling yourself because you have the funds to do it through an agent. You can be preparing yourself for these interviews. You can be getting ready physically, healing from the season. Or you can be going through basically another spring ball in college, being away from your family for the holidays. Like to me, like if you want these kids playing these bowl games, make it right after conference championship week. Then they can go home for the holidays. Then they can get ready for the draft. Like to me, the system is a cash cow system to be drag out for a long time to get TV ratings and money and the pockets of the TV, the TV producers. So um, I, I could, I couldn't get down with what Kirk is saying. I love Kirk. You know, I think he's really good at what he does, but to me, that wasn't, that wasn't a good take. That was, I, and to me, Matt Corral, I probably would have done the same thing. I probably would have played knowing that there's a risk of injury, but I can't fault any of these kids for, opting out of a bowl game that's a month and a half away, a month away when they have a chance to set up their families for life, really. Like, it, to me, it's a no-brainer. And fans that say they're quitters and stuff like that, I'm like, who are you quitting on? You're not quitting on anybody. You're helping your family. Family comes first to me. You know what I mean? So, Oh, but you're, you're, every, you're, you're speaking from well inside the machine here, right? Like, I want to cover a lot of the ground that you're talking about. Yeah. This terrain. Just explain to people who I don't think understand. When you say you were surrounded by come from nothing, people on campus working for that money, but come from nothing. Explain to people what come from nothing means when you're sending money back home to your family and people think that you're, you know, you're being you're being paid in books. It's not real money. Yeah, so you get paid in books, you get cost of attendance checks, and you get rent checks. A lot of these cost of attendance checks, I mean. They're way less than what a paycheck would be. And from my experience at UCF, it was a lot less at UCF than it was at Florida State in terms of cost of attendance. But even at Florida State, it's, it's hardly enough to you know survive from like week to week, month to month. And me, I had the good fortune of having parents that would help me out. A lot of these, a lot of these guys, like I said, the checks that they get from football go back to their families back home. You know what I'm saying? So they're barely like struggling from mill to mill. Like a lot of these guys are just going to the snack bars and eating PB and J's to, to survive protein shakes to survive. You know what I mean? And I'm not saying that, you know, we're starving or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. But when you have the opportunity to make millions of dollars and get your family out of whatever situations they're in, it's, it's a no-brainer. Why would you stick around another two months eating PB&Js when you can be getting your body shredded for the NFL draft? So when you're in front of these scouts, like, you're ready to go. They're like, yeah, we're taking that guy. Instead of another two months in that system where, you know, you're really breaking down your body. You're passionate about this. Why? Like, why is this one pissed you off? Like, where are you getting bothered from on this? Because you know the way the machine works, right? Like, you're well aware of what you're giving to that university. You loved college football. You loved your mm -hmm. university. Don't tell yes, me sir. I don't love football because I have to make a business decision at the end in a dangerous game. Well, I, th I think the thing is, you know, you just said it. It's a business decision, right? Coaches make business decisions. Um, TV analysts make business decisions. But all of a sudden, when a 21, 22-year-old kid wants to make a business decision, it's, it's not right. And, and, I, and I can't understand that in the fact that these kids are getting smarter. You know what I mean? They're, 
they're starting to get smarter and see the system. And I'll, I'll even talk about like the NIL stuff with, you know, what kind of went down in, in the state legislator this year where they try to delay the year to where it would have been 2022 where the can would get would keep getting kicked down the road where these guys can't profit off of their last name. Not the, not the names on the front of the Jersey. Like it, it, it literally makes zero sense that they tried slipping in a one liner to delay this, this NIL bill. And if Florida would have, if Florida would have delayed the whole country would have delayed the NCAA wouldn't have folded. And to me now it's just providing opportunities for female athletes, male athletes to run camps in their own name to, to get extra money in their pockets to help that help themselves out and help their families out. Like, man, it's, it's, it's kind of been a corrupt system for a while. And I think we're starting to get to where the kids are starting to figure out, like, you know, this isn't right. You know, we can use our name, our image, our likeness. I can opt out when, you know, the, really the balls in my court, like these coaches can go leave for a hundred million dollar contracts, the snap of a finger. But if a guy decides to opt out of one game that, the beef of Brady's bowl when you're eight and four, like, come on, man, make well, it make sense. When you say corrupt system, you were feeding the corrupt system. Did you realize when you were in it that you were feeding it? Did you realize when you were in it that, Hey man, a whole lot of unjust stuff is happening. What if I go back right now, how much money would I have made that season? If I just put it two years in the future, the season that you guys yeah. had at UCF. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, shoulda, coulda, woulda. You know, I, I don't, I'm not like a money hungry person or anything like that. Um, you know, I think of a guy like Donald Delahaye. Uh, I don't know if you remember him. He was our kicker at UCF, and all you had was a YouTube channel uh, back in 2016 and 2017. And you know, he would make all he would make was money off of subscribers, right? Like a dollar each subscriber, whatever it is. And the NCAA took away his eligibility because he had a YouTube channel and he was making YouTube videos as a UCF kicker and he hasn't played a, a down of football again, but now he's making a crap ton of money being an influencer because of his story, which is great for him, but he's a football player. He loves playing football and you know, that got stripped from him. And me, when I saw that, like, you know, some people were like, Oh, he's tripping. He gave up a scholarship, this and that. I said, no, nah, he stood up for what is right. Like, like, I, so when I saw that, I knew it was kind of corrupt, but, you know, I, I, I honestly didn't think my time in college football, we would see it get to this where, you know, it's starting to hit a little 180 where guys can start making money off of their name, image, and likeness. I don't know if we'll get to a point where they start getting paid salary um, just because, you know, you got walk-ons and stuff like that. You know, I don't know, like, I can't really speak on that because I, that's a tough one for me. That's a tough one. But I do believe that, if guys can get sponsorships for like shoe deals and stuff like that, why not? Like they're the ones, they're the product on the field. So, um, yeah, man, I, I didn't care about feeding the corrupt system. Cause I love playing ball. I love being part of the team. You know what I mean? But now that it's starting to, I don't know. It's starting to, it's starting to get in the right momentum where the players have more power. And, you know, I, I love seeing that. Is the part of you that's getting pissed off the injustice of it or when it's directed to Herb Street, is there some, man, don't say that you love football more than I love football because nobody loves football more than I love football. Like, don't tell me if I sit out a game that I don't love football. You know what I have to do to my body to play football? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Look, if, if we at Florida State made a bowl game this year, I probably wouldn't have played in it just considering what I've been through. You know what I mean? To me, these last couple months were important to prepare for the draft and whatnot. So, and, you know, I made that clear to my coaches, like leading up to seeing them. But look, coach, I know we might make a bowl game, but if it happens, like I got to, I got to get on to this next chapter of my life. I've been in college a long time. You know, if it was a, a playoff game, that's different. You know what I'm saying? Cause the opportunity to play for a championship is amazing. Maybe one day we'll get to a situation where, a guy is projected to go number one overall, right? I think, I don't know if you've seen the movie National Champions, but the whole plot line is a guy is projected to go number one overall and he opts out because of the injustice in, in, the, in the college athletics world. So to me, just the competitor of me, you know, I couldn't pass up an opportunity like that, but sometimes you got to 
think logically more than emotionally. You know what I mean? You have an emotional attachment to the university and your team, but also logically, like Matt Carrell hurt his ankle. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, God forbid any kid has an injury like me, they're not getting drafted. Like, that. and that's the reality, you know? So, and people say, well, you know, Tua had his injury, but still went fourth overall. Okay, that's a different story. You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody's got a different story. Jalen Smith blew out his knee. He probably would have been the number one overall pick, like, coming out of Notre Dame. So, you know, it's one of those things. Uh, it's, a, it's up to each individual, and, and that's really all it is. But I don't think you should fault any individual for what they decide to do because these kids play this game from the time they're young and they get to college. They feed everything they have into it just to have an opportunity to feed their families and continue to play the game they love while getting paid. That's the reward to get to the NFL, right? You get paid playing the game you love. Nothing sweeter than that. You say you love ball, but so people understand what you mean when you say you love ball, you almost lost your leg, correct? Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you tell the people what happened there? Because you came back to play football after that happened to you. So can you explain to people what happened? Because it was a very gruesome injury. Yeah, so I had a posterior knee dislocation where I had significant nerve, artery, and ligament damage. Um, you know, I had surgery that night to save my leg in terms of just restoring blood flow. And, you know, it was somewhat divine intervention. It was in, uh, in Tampa, right next to Tampa General, one of the best hospitals in, in really the country. And, you know, they were able to save my leg and underwent eight more knee surgeries after that with, you know, infections and stuff like that. But all things considered, you know, over at, all things considered, it worked out well. Uh, you know, I was able to save my leg and, you know, I busted my butt in rehab. And just for me, I couldn't accept that that's how my football career would end. Um, you know, I played, the like I said, I played this game since the time I was little and I've loved it. I fell in love with it from the time I was a kid playing in Hawaii. And for me, that's not how it was supposed to end. And that's not how it did end. And that's just because of pure love of the game, a pure love of competition and, and you know, just – a bunch of guys from a bunch of different backgrounds, guys that come from a lot, guys that don't come from a lot, coming together and really becoming family. And like, it's, it's a special game to me. There's nothing like it, you know, um, all 11 guys are operating as one. And when it's done right to me, it's like, it's like a good orchestra. Like everything's going on like at one time. And you know, when it's, when it's done right, it's a thing of beauty. And you know, that's why I love the game just because I see the opportunities it provides to, to people, really. You spent a couple of seasons playing the music in that orchestra. It had to be great fun to play quarterback that way. So when I talk to people about how hard that sport is that you love, how violent it is, how much it hurts, when I talk to people about that, can you take me through what it means to have eight surgeries? What the fear of all of that is what was happening in your life as you are dealing with, you know, I'm listening to this and I'm saying eight surgeries, just the inconvenience of having to go to the hospital eight times, never mind anything else, just the inconvenience of having to keep going to the hospital for multiple surgeries. What's happening here? Well, it's actually nine surgeries, it's eight after the initial night, but <clears throat> now it's just a lot of trying times. But to me, like, you got to have that that true approach of a one-day mentality. Um, man, it was, it was tough. It was tough. But um, I always had the vision of playing again. So I was holding on to that. And, you know, to me, when you have a vision in your life and, you know, you're serious about it, you just got to ask yourself each day if, you know, the decisions and the, and the moves you're making are aligning to get to where you want to go. And for me, that's – that was getting back on the football field and playing at a high level and – I was able to play at Florida State University. So, you know, I, I feel like I feel like I accomplished what I wanted to do, but now to me it's it's more so like what's next. To me, it's not like, okay, I accomplished this, I'm done. Nah, it's, life's always about improving and, and always getting better. So um I, I don't wanna like downplay that it was easy or anything like that, because it wasn't. But, you know, I had my mind made up from really the time I got hurt that that wasn't gonna be it. And you know, I I know it wasn't all 
all me because, you know, I had great surgeons and a lot of people praying for me. So, you know, thank you to everyone. But, yeah, you know, I just I made up my mind that that's what it was going to be. And you know, I worked for that. Do you remember the feeling of the first surgery? Like just everything that led up to it? Not 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 the eight afterward, but the night, you know, the, the night that you're going through the hardest stuff. Man, I'm going to be honest. It's kind of funny. Um, so I got hurt and, you know, I, they rushed me to the hospital and they were like, do you have any questions? And I said, I said, are y'all going to put a catheter in me? <laughs> I, was, I was like, and that is like, they're like, that's really what you're worried about. I said, I said, yeah, don't put that in me, please. Like, <laughs> but no, nah, it was crazy. So I woke up, man. And, you know, I had this metal contraption sticking out of my leg. I didn't really know the severity. I knew like, you know, it was serious because they rushed me into surgery, but they didn't tell me there was risk of losing my leg. Um, they did put a catheter in me, which sucked. But that that next week, I that, that next week, really I was in didn't the hospital. Want that, you really didn't want that catheter, huh? Nah, it's, nah. So I'll tell you why. My brother, he had a skateboarding injury, and like his ankle popped out of the bone, and and he said the worst part was the catheter. So I was like, I just had this nightmare of ever getting the catheter. Um, but no, yeah, it it was tough because, like, literally, I had this metal contraption that's about three feet sticking into the bones of my thigh, my shin, and, you know, from being able to just, you know, make guys miss on the run and stuff like that to barely being able to, to be on a, a walk or from getting from the door to the bed, like, without feeling like I just ran a mile. So that, it was, it was humbling, man. And, you know, you, you take those little things for granted, like being able to walk, um, bathe yourself and stuff like that man it was, it was really just humbling like just golly once when you know whatever you do gets taken away from you you kind of find out you know what you're really about you say humbling what's interesting to me is i imagine all of this right as i imagine someone fearing that they might lose their leg although you didn't know the severity of the situation whatever the physical pain was that you were feeling it sounds to me like what you remember the most about being the worst was being helpless afterward, just not being able to be, never mind maximum athlete, you needed people all of a sudden. That and you felt it sounds like that was the worst feeling than the physical pain. Yeah, not nah, like it was, you know, because really I couldn't do anything. I was really bedridden for a while, you know, and I think what kind of was a turning point for me was you know, I saw this special with uh, with Zach Miller, uh, Drew Brees, and this young man named Alex Ruiz. I think it was, I think it was Super Bowl week. Um, I believe it was Super Bowl week of 20, uh, 2019. And Alex had the same injury as me. Zach Miller had the same injury as me. And Alex had his leg amputated. But Alex came back and was playing football on a prosthetic leg and baseball on a prosthetic leg out in California. And seeing that, like, I started crying. Like, I texted the kid right away. I'm like, dude, bro, you're, you're a beast, bro. Like, like incredible, man. And, you know, just just seeing that, I was like, man, I got my leg, bro. Like, I'm, I can get back. You know, if, if he's doing that, like, to me, he's, his, his comeback is more incredible than mine. You know what I mean? But no one's ever going to talk about him because he was just a high school athlete. So, like, seeing that was just incredible incredible and you know you're, that was you're really you're, you're really you're talking about where inspiration comes from right because there you're feeling so hopeless you're feeling so needy you're feeling yeah. i'm not a confident athlete i'm not undefeated yeah. i'm not star quarterback i need somebody to help me piss i've got no hope and i'm gonna look over there yeah oh and that dude gives me hope i can get back because i i i didn't have it that bad yeah i know exactly exactly you know it's one of those things you know it was, it was funny. My dad's buddy, we went out to Vegas for, um, for, uh, I think it was Memorial day that year. And, uh, he comes up to me on, on the blackjack table and, you know, I'm still like in a big old brace, just got off crutches, just barely, barely like limping around still and stuff like that. He's like, he's like, you know, KZ, I know you don't see it, but a lot of people, most people, almost all people would kill to be in your position right now. I'm like, kind of double take. I'm like, I'm like, what do you mean, bro? Like, might not play football again. Like, and then I thought about it. I was like, I was like, dude, he's right. You know what I mean? Like I was able to accomplish so much at UCF and, you know, I, 
and I made so many connections in the coaching world and stuff like that. Like really all I've already done in my life, like what would have set me up for whatever I really want to do. A lot of people struggle, man. And to me, like whatever I went through, if that can be a, a motivation to whoever else, man, like that's great. That's, that's amazing. I feel like that's, that's what it's all about. If you waste your pain, you're just wasting it. If you can help someone else else out and learn those lessons through it, then, you know, that's where real growth comes from. Did you immediately start improving mentally right away from the, the you know, needing and not needing, not wanting to need? Uh, did you start getting better right away mentally, uh, improvement by increments, or were there was there a lot of pity involved with, like, you had to talk yourself into that? I had to talk myself into it, but I also think like just enjoying the small victories in, in that process. Like, you know, the first one for me was just getting that metal contraption out of my leg that was in there for about five, six weeks. And then I was able to go travel to the Fiesta Bowl with the team, which I mean, was a blessing because I was really in bed for about five weeks and then they took that out. And then I got to go travel with the team with, for the bowl game to go play LSU. And just being around people again, being around my guys again, like that helped a lot. Uh, and then there was a lot of ups and downs from the rehab process. You know, I had an infection about five months after the, the reconstruction and I had to get four more surgeries. So, and I had IV antibiotics for about six, seven months where I was just lost all the weight I put back on. It, it, was, a, it was a trying process, but the, the small victories for me is – is what kind of helped see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but yeah, I mean, to me, it's just those little things, those little things will help me get through it. I don't think people understand what tough is, though, when you're talking about what that year is, right? Because you're talking about a year crawling through some darkness, right? It's not just some hopes gone, maybe, or diluted. It's that you're also having the recurring surgeries, things keep going wrong. You are losing weight. Uh, every you, you keep pushing the rock up the hill and then ending up at the bottom of the hill again. And you're doing that for how long? 18 months, a year? Yeah, really, really a whole year. My last surgery was August of 2019. And my injury was November 2018, you know. So essentially the rehab process was restarted about three, four times. And it was trying, but godly that I have really good people around me to help me through it. You know, like Mary Vander Heiden, um, our head athletic trainer at UCF, like she was my sounding board for everything. Everything I was going through, I'd be like, I'd be like Mary, like if we don't do something about this, like I know I'm not going to be able to play again. Like I know it. And she'd be like, okay, we got to do it. So and it was never anything like, well, all right, yeah, you're probably not going to be able to anyway because of what you went through. You know, they they believe just as much as I did. And that's why I think it's so cool, like, to come back because it wasn't just me. You know, it was everybody else, like, investing into me. And, you know, that's a product of their work, too. And, you know, we just hustled. And then I think when COVID hit in, uh, was it early 2020? Um, they shut down shop. Shut, it happened right in the middle of spring ball and they shut down shop, but I was able to be in there for six hours a day rehabbing um, with like three other guys with the athletic training staff. And it was just us in the building. And really, I just got into a zone of like, kept getting better, kept getting better. And then I was back on the field in the, in the fall running scout team. And then I was getting my feet wet back again. And, you know, I just, I had in my mind, like, I'm ready. You know, and, you know, it was, it was tough, it was grueling, but it was all worth it, 100%. I imagine that there was some real healing in just being able to go from whatever dark place your mind was when you were needing to, oh, wait, I can work out six hours a day. I can work on my body, on my skill, on my craft. I can feel something that feels like football. Oh, wait, you're telling me I can work on me six hours a day. My guess is that that part of the path for you, football was healing, right? He's like, oh, no, here's these are steps I'm taking toward the thing I love again. Yeah, absolutely. Like like I said, the small victories were amazing. And then, you know, getting back on the field was just the icing on the cake. And, yeah, it was just 
yeah, it, it definitely was a healing process. That joy came back and, you know, just being able to jump cut, all that is truly a blessing, bro. One of the reasons that we wanted to have you on, Mackenzie, is because we believe in what it is you're doing uh, this weekend in Orlando. And we wanted to help you promote it uh, because it means something to you. The Hula Bowl is not in Hawaii. It's in Orlando. And half of the ticket sales, the reason we're talking to Mackenzie is because I really did, and we really did, wanted to get, get his message out to you on what it is that he's doing with and for the family of Otis Anderson Jr. If you want to tell people the backstory on this, Mackenzie, why he's important to you and why this is the cause you're promoting here so that they can support it, go ahead and uh, tell them what they need to know. Yeah, so, you know, Otis Anderson is a former teammate of mine, and um, unfortunately he passed away uh, last month in a, in a domestic dispute in his home. Uh, I won't get into the details, but... Uh, you know, Otis was like a little brother to me and, you know, he just brought so much joy into my life, so much joy into, you know, whoever's life, you know, he, he came across, he had a million dollar smile. He wore double golds when he played gold on top, gold on the bottom. And, you know, he was an electric player for us at UCF and he'll forever be solidified there. But, you know, at the Hula Bowl, we're, we're going to sell tickets and 50% of those proceeds are going to go to his mom, D, who was also affected in the, in the domestic dispute and thankfully you know she she is still alive and you know i think just the main thing is we want we want otis to keep living on through all of us and um yeah the the link will will be in my instagram so if you guys go check that out it's at mckenzie milton and it's all over my twitter as well to to go get the tickets but yeah rest in heaven otis man keep looking over us bro and it's a tough situation, but I think we owe it to we owe it to you, bro, to keep living on through all of us. The link is also in the episode description here on South Beach Sessions. Uh, Mackenzie, for those who do not know, this Otis Anderson Jr. was not the son of the famous University of Miami Otis Anderson. Uh, the details uh, about the domestic abuse and the incident with his father. We don't have to get into the details, but uh, how close were you to him? Yeah, like I said, he was like a little brother. He came in in the spring after my freshman year, and he, he's like family, man. And you know, I wish I would have. I wish I would have got to talk to him, uh, you know, before all that happened. But it just kind of puts things in perspective that you never really know what's going on. So. I think it's important to just tap in with the people you love and and just, yeah, man, just never take a moment for granted. Uh, and that's kind of just the lessons I've learned over the past couple of years, you know. And it's truly the first time I really lost someone that, you know, that that hurt like that. And it's just, yeah, man, it's tough. It's tough. But uh, I know he's in a better place now and I know he's looking over us. But to me, like I said, it's, I know money can't change what, what happened, but for me, it's more so about his his memory continuing to live on because he touched everyone he came in contact with. I, I don't think you'll ever encounter someone that has a bad thing to say about Otis Anderson Jr. Because that's just the kind of kid he was and kind of man he was. And yeah, and go check out his, uh, his Juice Apparel. He uh, just launched a colon line right before he passed with his mother. Um, and to me, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just continuing to support him and you just got to live on through all of us now. Our audience generally does a pretty good job of supporting people. So I ask you this, the Hula Bowl college football all-star game Saturday, noon Eastern bounce house in Orlando. Our audience is a national and international one, Mackenzie. People can buy tickets, right? And you're saying that half the proceeds will then go to the family, whether they go to the game or not, correct? Yes, sir. So yeah, just attach that link. To the The tickets are twenty five dollars, and half of that is going straight to straight to his mother, D. Anderson. Um, extremely strong woman. Uh, but yeah, if y'all can support O as as much as you guys can, appreciate the love. Thank you, sir. Thank you.